Suggestions to Teachers from The Tree Dwellers by Catherine Elizabeth Dopp Recorded for LibriVox.org The test of a book is the service it can render. The character of the service demanded by it is determined by the needs of those to whom it is devoted. This book was not written for the child of five or six years, although children of that age have shown an interest in it. The child of five or six is absorbed in the activities of his own home and his immediate environment. His own neighborhood may well constitute the chief source from which to draw the subject matter in these early years. Even though many of the processes which he observes are complex, it matters little to the child at this time, for so easily do they lend themselves to dramatic play that they cause him little difficulty. The child at this time, therefore, has no need of this book. But there comes a time when the ideal and the real world begin to separate. No longer content with a make-believe process, and unable to control the complex processes of modern life, he feels a need that cannot be satisfied by the resources of his neighborhood alone. There is need of looking elsewhere in order to find experiences that are sufficiently related to his spontaneous activities to enlist his attention, and sufficiently related to what is best in the society in which he lives to form legitimate subject matter for this period of development. The materials which constitute the subject matter of this book have been selected and arranged with reference to the needs of the child at such a time. It is the child of six and a half or seven years for whom this book is intended. Were it not true that so many books that are written for children have little regard for real facts, it would seem unnecessary to state that in no case has material been introduced into this book which cannot be justified by reference to a recognized authority in anthropology, paleontology, or geology. The story form by means of which these facts are conveyed is merely a literary device for bringing home to the child the truth that has thus far been ascertained regarding the fundamental steps in the development of our industrial and social institutions. The portrayal of the situation which caused our early forefathers to rob birds' nests and kill young animals will no doubt shock the sentimentalist who orders eggs or veal as a matter of course. There might be good ground for his feeling were there not present in the child the instinct to do similar deeds, even though living under social conditions that do not justify such acts. Anyone who will take the trouble to recall his own childhood or to make the acquaintance of children of six and a half or seven years, will realize that such instincts are present, and that they must find expression in one form or another. Is it wise to ignore the facts of the case, and allow the child to form the habit of gratifying his blind instincts? Or shall we recognize the situation, and meet it with all the wisdom at our command? Is it not the better plan to tell the child frankly of the way in which people lived, at the time when they did what he would like to do now, and lead him to discover the changes that have taken place, that lead us to disapprove of actions which, under different conditions, were considered good? The teacher, who knows that she has good ground for her convictions, is not afraid to look upon a question from all sides. The fact that the teacher is willing to look at the question from the child's point of view is a means of establishing sympathetic relations between her and the child, who thus becomes willing to look at the question from the teacher's point of view. A sounder morality can be developed by honestly facing the facts with the child, and by giving him the benefit of a broader experience, than by leaving him to face the situation alone in the light of but part of the facts. The problems with which the child at this time is grappling are so similar in character to those of the race during the early periods of its development, that they afford the child a rich background of experience suited to his own needs. The successful solution of these problems is as important with reference to the development of the individual today as then in determining the welfare of the race. A firm basis for the development of the intellectual, the moral, and the physical life can thus be laid at this time by a wise use of the experiences of the race when it was laying the foundations upon which our civilization rests. It must be remembered that there is as wide a difference between the real situation in the hunting life and the scenes depicted in this book as there is between the real attitudes of primitive people and those of the child, which are idealized forms of the same attitudes. The child would shrink in terror from the real conflict. His interest is in the dramatized form. If this dramatic interest of the child is satisfied, it can be made to pay tribute to the sciences and the arts. If it is ignored or repressed, it is liable to find expression in acts of cruelty. See Catherine E. Dopp some steps in the evolution of social occupations the elementary school teacher 
May and September, 1903. The University of Chicago Press. Method. The subject matter is presented with the view of economizing the energy of the teacher as well as that of the child. The attempt has been made to base each lesson upon the experience of the child, or at least upon that which he may be enabled to experience if he has not yet done so. This experience is so treated as to secure problems for advanced thought. The purpose of things to think about is to awaken the inquiring attitude. It is at this point of the lesson that the child is given the opportunity he prizes so highly of telling what he has seen, heard, or done. Here he meets with the new problems which compel him to reconstruct his experiences. The printed questions, which map out the main features in the development of the lesson, should be discussed freely. Care should be taken to avoid mechanical answers. It is much better to leave questions unsettled, or to leave the subject with several different solutions that the different children have worked out, than it is to secure uniformity by imposing upon the child the judgment of the teacher or of the author of the text. In case of a necessary delay in answering a question, on account of a lack of related experience, the teacher should use the means that are available for supplying the child with the necessary experience. If the printed questions are discussed before the story is read, there will be less danger of a mechanical use of the book than might arise from the habit of reading the story first and making answers to the questions so as to fit the story. THE STORY The function of the story is to supply the child with racial experiences that will enrich his own more narrow personal experience. It is not intended merely to please, but to present facts in a form which the child can understand. By using the simple form of a sequence of sentences, each sentence standing by itself, less difficulty is presented to the child in reading than if the paragraph form had been employed. The greater ease with which the young child reads this style, together with the fact that the rhythm in a majority of the stories is of a character in keeping with the subject, and readily appreciated by the child, seem to justify the use of this style for a few months of the child's life. THINGS TO DO The teacher should use her judgment in regard to how many of these suggestions it is best to carry out in the school hours. In schools where little work has yet been done in pantomime, drawing, modeling, and other kindred modes of activity, it will probably be the better plan to have many of the suggestions carried out in hours of play. If the teacher takes an interest in what the child does outside of school hours, as well as in what he does in regular recitation and work periods, and if she utilizes the experiences of the child that are gained in informal ways, she will have no difficulty in securing the heartiest cooperation in the work of the school. Where constructive work has already been introduced, the teacher will have no difficulty in selecting from the suggested activities those that are best adapted to her purpose. She should always feel free to substitute for any of the printed suggestions others which may more nearly meet the needs of the child in the locality in which she lives. Typical Modes of Activity If there is one principle more than another upon which all educational practice, not simply education in art, must base itself, it is precisely in this that the realization of an idea in action through the medium of movement is as necessary to the formation of the mental image as is the expression, the technique, to the full play of the idea itself. John Dewey Gesture and Pantomime The muscular sense is the foundation sense from which all the others have been derived. Perceptions through sight and hearing are uncertain, often requiring to be verified by the use of the muscular sense or even of the use of smell or taste knowledge gained through the use of sight and hearing may be superficial. That which comes through the use of the muscular sense is wrought into the very fiber of one's being. Among the more simple modes of using the muscular sense are gesture and pantomime. They are within the reach of every teacher. They require no materials. A worthy idea and the desire to communicate it are the essential conditions for profitable work. Gesture and pantomime are two powerful tools in education to be used carelessly. The teacher should aid the child in discovering the real motive which animated the character to be represented. She should appeal to the best in the child. In so doing, she will be able to use gesture and pantomime in such a way as to transform activities, which, when undirected, are liable to degenerate into vicious habits, into activities of great moral significance. Teachers who have tried gesture and pantomime as a preparatory step to other modes of activity have found it invaluable as a means of securing a genuine growth of imagery and free expression in a variety of forms. Play. 
It is now well known that many of the child's spontaneous plays are idealized reproductions of the serious activities of primitive people. It is possible to make a much larger use of these plays than has yet been made. It is hoped that the suggestions that are scattered throughout the pages of this and the succeeding volumes of this series will enable the teacher to make a large use of this most important educational force. Sand Modeling Almost every child has had experience in sand modeling before coming to school. The part of the teacher is to enable him to make use of this habit with reference to new ends. One who has not learned through experience the value of this art is scarcely in a position to realize what a stimulus it is to the growth of definite images of geographical forms. When based upon observation, as it always should be, it is unsurpassed as a mode of developing and communicating adequate conceptions of topographical features. Sand pans should be provided so that there will be at least one pan for every two children. If each child can have a pan, the conditions will be still more favorable. Whether sand pans are available or not, every primary school room should be supplied with a large sandbox, two or three if there is room for them. Excellent results have been attained in many schools by modeling typical areas and representing in a graphic way the life of the place. If the sandbox is lined with zinc, rivers and lakes may be represented with ease. In case there is no zinc lining, water may be represented by the use of tinfoil, or by glass which may be laid in the bottom of the box leaving only such portions uncovered as are needed in order to represent the water. Moss, twigs, grass, stones, toy animals, all help to make the scene more lifelike. By sprinkling the sand with lime water, it hardens so as to keep its shape for a long time. Clay Modeling Although clay does not respond so quickly to the touch as sand, it preserves its shape more easily. The more skill that the teacher has in clay modeling, the more freedom she will feel in the work but she should not hesitate to make use of this mode of expression, even though she has to learn with the child. The aim is not so much to secure finish in details, or a result similar to that reached by other people, as it is to secure the growth of the image and freedom in expression. Only by leading the child to compare the result of his work with the image in his mind does the image grow. By so doing, and by referring to the real object when present, the child gradually gains control over this mode of acquiring and communicating ideas. It costs but little to supply a class with clay, for the same material may be used again and again. It is desirable, however, to have a sufficient supply to permit the preservation of the best work for some time. Clay may be bought ready mixed at art stores and in kindergarten supply stores. The common gray clay costs two or three cents a pound. Artist clay costs five cents a pound. A cheaper kind can be obtained of manufacturers of sewer pipes. The teacher will find suggestions regarding the use of clay in Fry's Child in Nature, pages 36 through 8, Kellogg's Forty Lessons in Clay Modeling, Prang's Art Instruction in Primary Schools, First Year, pages 27 to 39, Second Year, pages 32 to 43, and in Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora A. Smith's Froebel's Occupations, pages 32 through 43. Excellent articles illustrated by the work of children appear in the University Elementary Record, which is published by the University of Chicago Press, Chicago. Basketry. The materials of which baskets are made are less pliable than clay or sand, yet the child of seven is able to manipulate some of them. Where possible, he should be encouraged to exploit his environment in the search for raw materials that are adapted to this purpose. In many localities, tough grasses, willows, rushes, or other pliable materials are present, and even though the child finds little that is adapted to the purpose, the mere search for materials enables him to appreciate the value of the commercially prepared ones and aids him in picturing these materials in their raw state. The pleasant days of autumn should be used for collecting such supplies as are available at that time. These may be prepared for use and stored until they may be needed later in the year. If the child makes a ball of braided grass, he will find many ways of using it later in making baskets, mats, cradles, sandals, or anything which he may choose to make of it. Where natural materials cannot be obtained, commercially prepared ones may be substituted. Raffia, uncolored or colored with vegetable dyes, rattan reeds, and splints may be obtained wherever kindergarten supplies are kept, as well as in large seed stores and in most of the department stores in large cities. Of the many books that are appearing upon the subject, probably none is more suggestive with reference to the significance of the art than George Wharton James's Indian Basketry, 
and none more helpful with reference to mastering the processes than Mary White's How to Make Baskets. Drawing and Painting Since these arts were originally derived from gesture language, it is not strange that gesture and pantomime are the best means of preparing the child for these modes of communication. The child who has difficulty in expressing his image by means of drawing and painting should be given the opportunity to experiment by means of pantomime until his image has become so clear that he can express it in a less real way. Few children fail to draw and paint reasonably well when afforded this opportunity that should be denied to none. In order to secure the best results, the teacher should be careful not to repress spontaneity by criticizing too severely. On the other hand, she should induce the child to make such comparisons of his work with his image and with the object when present, as to prevent the formation of careless habits of work. Although watercolors are used in some schools, such materials present more difficulties than it seems worth the while for the child to encounter. More satisfactory results have thus far been reached by the use of blackboard crayon, colored crayon, and charcoal. Language. When the child talks about what he has experienced, his language is almost invariably simple and direct. The lessons in this book afford ample opportunity for the use of the fundamental forms of language in communicating actual experience. Many of the stories may well be supplemented by stories that the child tells himself. Care should be taken, however, to keep the child within the limits of what was possible during the age to which his story refers. Much benefit is derived from allowing the children of the class to dramatize a story after they have read it and represented it by means of pantomime. Although there is ample room for written work, it is oral rather than written language that should receive emphasis at this time. Field Lessons the geographical phases of the work are referred to so frequently throughout the text, as well as under the special suggestions for each lesson, that little need be added at this time except to emphasize the fact that the teacher should make use of every opportunity to cultivate in the child an intelligent interest in his natural environment. Perhaps nothing will contribute more toward developing this interest than field lessons. The value of these lessons will depend upon whether an adequate motive is aroused in the child for taking the trip and upon whether he is given the opportunity to make use of the experience gained in a practical way. There are schools in crowded quarters of large cities where it does not yet seem practicable to take an entire class out on a field lesson, but it is always feasible to make use of informal observations that the child makes from day to day, as well as the results of trips that have previously been taken by some members of the class. During the time that this book is used, it is hoped that at least two or three of the following field trips or excursions may be made. 1. To uncultivated spots on hillsides, in the woods, and on natural meadows, to find a. A place where the tree-dwellers might have lived. b. Wild foods, and to discover, if possible, the reasons for abundance or scarcity of certain forms. c. Trees that offer protection from the sun and rain, and branches that are tough and strong. d. Suitable sticks for primitive implements and weapons. e grasses, barks, willows, rushes, and other tough and flexible fibers for basketry. F. The topographical features which later are to be represented in sand. G. What animals now live in uncultivated places. 2. To a brook or river to find A. The best drinking places for animals. B. The best fords. C. The best places to build bridges. D. Stones for primitive implements and weapons e. How the river grinds the stones, f. What the river carries in its water, and g. What plants and animals may be seen there. 3. To a circus to see the wild animals, so as to be better able to realize what the animals that lived when the tree-dwellers did were like. 4. To a farm to find a. What animals live there, how they are taken care of, and how they differ from wild animals b. What plants are cultivated, on the farm and in the gardens, how they are cultivated, and how they differ from the wild plants that can be found in uncultivated spots. 5. To a gravel bed or stone quarry to find a. What kinds of stone are there, b. How stone is quarried and what it is used for, c. A problem with reference to how the gravel bed or the stone quarry was made. End of section. This recording is in the public domain.